So I'm very excited to be here to talk with you all today. Um, I am a, as Jordan said, a fourth year PhD student at the CUNY Graduate Center and I work uh, at the City College of New York and the New York Botanical Garden. I am physically here in New York, but my biological heart is living in Florida uh, where I did my master's degree uh, at the University of Central Florida studying uh, these lizards here called mole skinks. We were funded by U.S. Fish and Wildlife to provide input on the listing decision for these lizards. So we were looking at like their population structure and genetic diversity. Um, and it really ignited my sort of love of conservation and, and was my start as a biologist. Uh, and if you have ever spent time searching for tiny fossorial lizards or snakes or anything that don't want to be found, you'll know why I'm here talking to you about plants today who stay in the same spot and are very cooperative. So anyways, I've always really been motivated by conservation and preserving biodiversity. And one of the current big threats to biodiversity, uh, along with habitat loss, is climate change. So this is a graphic that shows the uh, annual mean temperature uh, over the last about 150 years. So uh, the blue colors are cool, the, the warm colors are warm. <laughs> uh, you could see sort of at the beginning of the 20th century, there was a lot of blue all over the map and now we're getting a little bit more yellow and a little bit more orange. And finally, the last few decades have been uh, quite red. Uh, so uh, increase of temperature is not the only impact of climate change. We've had precipitation regime changes, uh, more extreme events, and this has all been impacting species distributions. Over the last few decades, we have seen how climate is driving species poleward or uh, upslope towards cooler temperatures, uh, how it has been altering species co community composition and also altering species phenology. So like uh, plants are flowering earlier in the year. As the climate continues to change, it's really important that we make accurate predictions of species distributions in the near future for species and land management and conservation policy. So that is sort of the motivation for the, the talk today. Um, we're going to start with sort of uh, the traditional approach to predicting species distributions in, in the future, uh, and then move on to talk about uh, more advanced framework, uh, what I'm gonna call the current framework for predicting species distribution, uh, talk about one area for improvement in that framework, and then talk about how that can be applied to a semina reticulata. And at, at this point, I do just want to mention that I am currently working on my PhD. This is one of the chapters of my dissertation, and it's in progress. So um, in this fourth part, I'm going to be talking about uh, the plans for the work and sort of some of our preliminary results and the work that has been done, uh, but the I won't be able to tie a nice bow on it and tell you the whole story uh, at this point. So starting with this uh, traditional approach, I want to illustrate it with this study from 1999 from Box et al, who were interested in predicting uh, the distribution and the future distribution of 28 plant species across Florida. Um, I'm gonna focus in on one of them, the gumbo limbo tree, which is pictured here in the illustration. And also you can see their sort of iconic peeling bark uh, in this photograph. So uh, they first looked at the contemporary distribution of gumbo limbo in Florida or the 1999 distribution uh, shown here on the left. So you can see uh, at that point, Gumbo Limbo occupied uh, some of Southern Florida and, and, and the coasts. Uh, and then they looked at the climate conditions of those regions that Gumbo Limbo occupied. And this is an abbreviated version of the table from the paper, but you can see they used uh, climate variables like 
uh, maximum temperature and minimum temperature and annual precipitation to describe those conditions where gumbo limbo can be found. This climate envelope or the climate tolerances for gumbo limbo uh, were then projected into different climate scenarios. So in this paper, uh, they used a one degree Celsius increase and a two degree Celsius increase. And you can see the projections for gumbo limbo under those two scenarios. As the climate is getting warmer, gumbo limbo is uh, expanding northward. Uh, more recent papers which use this approach um, often use future climate models like the coupled model in a comparison project with different carbon emission scenarios. Um, but this is a super useful approach. Uh, it's, it's still commonly used today because it gives us an idea of where species might find suitable habitat in the future. But what it doesn't do is account for the process of how they get there. So when environment becomes unsuitable, species have three options. They can move to uh, areas with suitable conditions. They can adapt to the new conditions where they are or go locally extinct. So for example, uh, looking at the gumbo limbo in 1999, they were in South Florida and it was predicted that they would have suitable habitat all along the Florida Peninsula after a two degree increase, but would they be able to actually, would the plants be able to actually move to occupy those regions? So the sort of next generation of studies, what I'm gonna call the current approach, uh, incorporates dispersal. And they do this using demographic models. And these demographic models don't only go from the current time to the future, but they start in the past, like 10,000 years ago, last glacial maximum, and look at how the species has dispersed until now, and then use that to inform the future. And they also incorporate modeling of genetic diversity across the landscape. And we know genetic diversity can be really important for um, resilience to environmental change. So uh, for this approach, I'm going to talk about this study from Brown et al. in 2016, uh, who were studying the hot rock beard tongue, which is a very fun name pictured here uh, on the right, which occurs in the northwestern US in that green area. So this framework starts off in a similar way to the traditional approach. Uh, this They assess the species environmental tolerances, this time through species distribution modeling. Uh, to find areas of suitable habitat for this beard tongue. But uh, now the approach differs. So they take the species uh, current environmental tolerances and project them into 41 time periods um, between 21,000 years ago and now. And then based on the landscape suitability across time, they use demographic models along with parameters of species specific traits like migration rates to model how the species moves over time. And this demographic modeling platform keeps track of the genetic consequences of that movement. Now, because the species specific traits uh, used in this framework have some uncertainty around them, like we don't exactly know what the migration rate of the hot rock beard tongue is, uh, they ran a whole bunch of models using uh, different sets of parameters illustrated with these uh, different colors here, and then kept track of the genetic consequences of the movement. And finally, um, generate summary statistics from each of those models uh, based on the genetic history. So uh, the purple parameter set generated some demographic models, which had some genetic consequences, which generated the purple distribution of summary statistics. Same for the blue parameters, et cetera. And to validate one uh, set of models or one model, they collect 
empirical data from the from real populations of the hot rock beard tongue and compare that to the stimulation. So in this illustration, uh, we can see that the observed genetic data most closely matches the orange parameter set. Finally, they ran the, uh, using the orange parameters, they ran this uh, demographic model uh, to 2080 and uh, to 100 generations after 2080 to get an idea of the uh, distribution of the species and the genetic diversity at both of those points in time. So these were their results. On the left is the current distribution of the species and the predicted allelic diversity. So yellow is high allelic diversity, high genetic diversity, and purple is low genetic diversity. And then in the middle is the panel for 2080. Uh, gray areas are areas where the species has gone locally extinct. Uh, and then, um, yellow areas where they have high genetic diversity. So you can see there's quite a few areas where they've gone extinct, uh, but the areas where they are present um, have quite high allelic diversity. And then if we look at the last panel, uh, this is 100 generations after 2080. Um, they haven't lost too much uh, habitat. Their, their distribution is quite similar, but the genetic diversity has, has decreased. There's a lot more a lot more purples and reds than in the previous panel. And we can even compare uh, what the results for, for this species would be under the traditional approach on the left and under this approach uh, on the right. Uh, so you can see that the traditional approach is sort of simplified. We only get an idea of where the species might be occupying, where uh, under this approach, we, we informed by their dispersal, we have an idea of where the species um, has gone locally extinct, what is still suitable habitat, and what their genetic diversity or their resilience to further environmental change might be across the landscape. Uh, so that's very cool. This is one of the studies that like really got me excited about, about my PhD and inspired me to do this work. So uh, looking back at our three options for species when the climate uh, becomes unsuitable, Again, they can move to new areas, uh, adapt to the new conditions, or go locally extinct. And this framework uh, takes care of two of them. So it models how they're moving over time and local extinction, but doesn't account for adaptation. Uh, what I propose is that we can uh, account for niche evolution or the change in a species' environmental tolerances over time into this framework. So um, this is just a look back at one of the figures from the Brown et al. paper, uh, illustrating that they are using the species contemporary environmental tolerances or contemporary niche and projecting that into all of these different time periods. So this assumes um, niche conservatism. The species niche is not changing. But if we could infer the species environmental tolerances at 21,000 years ago, at 10,000 years ago, at 6,000 years ago, and project that into the corresponding time period, um, we could incorporate niche evolution into this framework. And we can infer the uh, climatic tolerances at those times using phylogenetic niche construction uh, from a recent paper published by Guillory uh, just this year in a very simplified uh, illustration of what they, what they do in that paper. Imagine you have a phylogenetic tree with an outgroup and three tips. Uh, so you see here we have uh, Atriloba as the outgroup and then Parvoflora, Reticulata, and Encana. And we're interested in what the environmental tolerances of A. Reticulata are at uh, this green or gray time, in, time point in the phylogeny. The first step is to characterize each of the species uh, contemporary environmental tolerances. So on the left here, we have mean temperature on the x-axis and suitability on the y-axis. And you can see each of these species has a little different response to annual mean temperature. And then using the approach from Guillory et al, 
uh, infer what the environmental tolerance of A. reticulata was uh, in the past at that time point. And uh, we can do that for any point along this phylogeny. So uh, again, then once we have inferred the climatic tolerance at that point in time, we can uh, project it into the corresponding time period. And in addition, we can compare whether the current framework, which assumes niche conservatism, the environmental tolerances are not changing, to this new niche evolution model where we're modeling how the species climatic tolerances have changed through time, and by running both and then comparing which one results in genetic diversity or patterns of genetic diversity that most closely match the observed genetic data in the same way that the framework um, uses the observed genetic diversity to determine the species parameters. So that's the plan. That is uh, sort of the goal of this project. And I'll be using a seminar reticulata to uh, test it. And I want to give some background uh, on the species and the family, since this is the, the Tory uh, Botanical Society lecture. Let's talk about plants for a little bit. So Asimines in the family Ananaceae, which has over 2,000 species, most of which are tropical. Uh, and in fact, Asimina is the only genus in the Ananaceae family, which doesn't occur in the tropics. Um, Asimina is sister to the East Asian genus Disipalum within the tribe Anuni. Uh, this connection between Eastern North America and Eastern Asia, I think is a really interesting biogeographical pattern. Uh, uh, anyways, and they diverged between 50 and 30 million years ago, so quite a while ago uh, in the Eocene. Uh, this tribe contains a bunch of edible species. So here we have pictured soursop, uh, which is also called uh, graviola, guanabana, uh, cherimoya is in this tribe, as well as uh, the common pawpaw, uh, Asimina triloba, which many of you may have eaten. Uh, this is the largest edible tree fruit native to North America. So uh, zooming in a little bit, the genus Asimina was originally described in 1763 and contains 12 species, which occur within Eastern North America. Uh, but most of the species diversity is in the Southeast US, in Florida and Southern Georgia and Alabama. Uh, this genus can be split into sort of three morphological groups of species. The first of which is Asimina. These are the two tree-like species, Asimina triloba and Asimina parviflora. Uh, these species are associated with a little bit wetter habitat than the rest of the group. They have these um, really dark red flowers and their, their flowers have been described to smell uh, like rotting meat. Mmm, delicious. <laughs> I guess that helps uh, attract pollinators to them. Uh, this picture on the left is actually some Asimina triloba that were planted on the campus of City College. The second group is Deringothamnus. This contains the two dwarf pawpaw. So these are just um, less than a meter tall, maybe half a meter tall, even, even smaller. They're quite small. <laughs> um, they uh, don't have the characteristic like three or four maris uh, flowers of the rest of the group. They have between six and 12 narrow petals that you can see uh, in this photograph. These two species are really dependent on regular fire um, and are only really found in high quality habitat even within their restricted ranges. So one of these species has only been vouchered um, in one county, in Volusia County, in eastern Florida, and the other species is vouchered from a few counties on the west coast of Florida. 
Uh, finally, the largest group uh, is Pediothamnus. This contains eight species of shrubs. There is some variation in flower coloration. They can be sort of creamy, white, pinkish, reddish. Um, the flowers can be three or four maris. Uh, the leaf shape varies a little bit, um, as well as the floral smell and the, the flowering time. But they all have this um, corrugated uh, surface on the inside of the inner petal, which you can see in the picture. It's in red. I don't know if you can see it very well. We'll see more pictures later. Um, but uh, this is a sort of nectary and attracts pollinators. Uh, so these three morphological groups um, were based on the traits that these species were originally described with, these morphological traits. And these groups have been treated uh, quite differently by different authors. So some authors, um, small, described these three groups as their own genera. Um, other authors have put them all within a simina. Uh, Kral, who did a really extensive um, work on, on this group in 1960, described uh, put Pidiothamnus and Asimina together within Asimina and described Deringothamnus as separate. And that has, that's pretty calm. That's still how many uh, recognize the group today. Uh, but the molecular phylogenetic work uh, doesn't really support these three groups being distinct. So um, this, this first study, which was done in 2016 with inner simple sequence repeats, uh, found Asimina triloba and the two Deringothamnus species as a clade, uh, and then Asimina parviflora, the other Asimina uh, sensu stricto species within Pidiothamnus. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not too sure about this species, this, this, this phylogenetic reconstruction, because these markers are typically used or more reliable, more reliably used for uh, describing genetic diversity within a species, not at, not at this level. Um, but if there, the following year, there was a study uh, using chloroplast markers and a couple nuclear markers by Lee et al. And uh, they found a similar triloba as sister to the rest of the species, uh, which is congruent with some of the phylogenetic work done at the family level. But they also found uh, are two Deringothamnus species, Asimina pulchella and Asimina um, regali, as uh, non monophyletic. And uh, there is some uh, genomic work in progress. So, a next generation phylogenetic tree that we're working with collaborators on, uh, contributing Asimina samples to a, a family level tree to hopefully have a uh, higher resolution uh, phylogenetic tree in the near future. Uh, and then zooming in again to a seminar reticulata. So this is uh, a photo of a, a, a standard <laughs> a seminar reticulata flower they have larger, these three larger outer petals that are cream or yellow or white, um, and then three inner petals that have this red color on the corrugated area on the inside of the inner petal. Uh, these spe this species occurs all along the Florida Peninsula. So the on the map on the right, the teal points are the species occurrences from GBIF. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about their reproduction. Uh, so their flowers are perfect. They have male and female parts. The female parts uh, mature first. Uh, so you can see in this photo, the um, pistil is sort of glistening, but the uh, stamen or the pollen are, are not mature yet. Uh, beetles are really common. common pollinators in the species. <laughs> There's a picture here of a beetle just covered in their large pollen, which is just really common to see in the field. Um, so pollen beetles, soldier beetles, vine weevils, 
potentially um, some flies, bumblebees in this species uh, are pollinators. Uh, and there was a really cool study uh, that looked at hand pollination that pollinated flowers from pollen on the same plant, from a, the closest plant and from a plant at least 50 meters away. And the flowers that were pollinated with pollen from the same plant uh, only initiated fruit about half the time compared to the other flowers. And that fruit only matured like a 10th of the time. Uh, so it's, it's really uh, like self-pollination of the same flower or of the same plant is really, uh, is not very likely. Uh, they have quite large fruits that are documented to be eaten by gopher tortoises, raccoons, and other small mammals. And I mentioned fire being important for our two deer and goat family species, but fire is also quite important for Asimina reticulata. Uh, it has been shown, more recent fire has been shown to increase uh, flower production, fruit production, uh, even seeds within the fruits. So while Asimina reticulata is pretty common across Florida, fire is, uh, dramatically increases its prevalence. So sort of coming back to the point, uh, Asimina reticulata are a great system to test this framework of niche conservatism versus niche adaptation in predicting the future of species distributions because uh, they're sort of a Goldilocks. So their generation time uh, is not too long so that we can still see changes in their distribution over the next 50 or 60 years by 2070. And it's not too short that the, the historical signal of their movement is not lost in their genes. They uh, don't disperse too far or not enough. So they're still, they still have some signature of um, geographic structure in their genes, and they have diverged long enough that uh, there is some potential for a uh, niche adaptation to have occurred within the group. So if we take a, back, take a look back at uh, the framework for this approach, we are missing a couple of pieces uh, for a seminar reticulata. The first being the observed genetic data and the second being the character, characterization of niche evolution. So tackling the um, population genetic data first, this, uh, this March, I went to the field. I traveled to Florida to collect uh, tissues. These were some of my accommodations. I'm really missing uh, being in the field right now in New York City in December. <laughs> Uh, so while I was there, we were able to collect uh, tissue from nine populations of Asimina reticulata. So on the map here on the right, uh, again in the teal are those GBIF occurrences, uh, and in the red or maroon color are where we collected uh, tissue samples. So we got a, could, a pretty good representation of, of their distribution. Also while we were in the field, I collected uh, tissue samples from seven other Asimina species to contribute to this uh, phylogenetics work. Uh, we're working on extracting DNA from these tissues and are going to generate uh, reduced representation genomic libraries uh, using 3RAD, sort of similar to RADseq. And so while we were in the field, actually this was in June, a little bit later in the year, but we found this fungus on a lot of the plants, uh, especially around Gainesville, and haven't been able to identify it. If you know any uh, fungus experts, <laughs> we would be really interested to figure out what, what this fungus was. Okay, so uh, back to the point, we have uh, beyond collection of the genetic data and our planning sequencing. 
So now we need to fill the second gap uh, and determine the niche of a semina reticulata uh, at multiple points in the past. So the first step is to characterize the niche for each species in a semina because we're using the entire phylogenetic tree of the genus to reconstruct uh, the niche. So the, the first approach we're using for this is ecological niche modeling, building uh, models using these eight bioclimatic variables listed here on the right. And in addition, this summer, we started data collection uh, on optimum photosynthesis temperatures for each of the species uh, with a LICOR 6800. Uh, and you can see our preliminary uh, data here. So on the x-axis is temperature, on the y-axis is assimilation or um, photosynthesis, and we scaled this across each of the individuals. Um, but June in Florida was not the happiest uh, time for the LICOR. We had, we had a bit of a hard time keeping the LICOR uh, where we wanted it in terms of temperature and humidity uh, and light source. So it seems like if we want to really reliably collect uh, optimum photosynthesis temperatures for the species, uh, it is going to take a lot of effort. Uh, if anybody has experience using LICOR in Florida in the summer, I'd be interested to see if you have any advice for keeping the LICOR happy. <laughs> so, so that's our that's how we're that's how we're characterizing the contemporary niche of each species, uh, and then we'll reconstruct the niche along a well-supported species-level phylogeny, uh, either using the uh, 10 Sanger loci uh, tree from Lee et al. that we talked about before, or hopefully the uh, genomic next generation tree will be published in the near future and we can uh, utilize that tree. So we filled both of our gaps. Uh, we've seen how sort of all of these pieces come together uh, and we will we'll be able to test really if a model of niche conservatism or a model of niche evolution fit a semina reticulata better and predict a semina reticulata's distribution in the near future, um, as well as get an idea of the structure of genetic diversity. So as I mentioned before, this is still a work in progress. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about our expectations quickly and then wrap up. So I think one of the, the clues to whether um, niche conservatism or niche evolution is going to fit better in, uh, in this species is just looking at the, um, where each of the species in the genus occur. So again, uh, on this map, the teal points are semina reticulata, and you can see there are also lots of other species that occur sort of in the same regions or areas as a semina reticulata. Um, and in fact, if we uh, look at an environmental PCA, so look at uh, what environmental space, not just geographic space, these species are occupying, uh, a semina reticulata again here is in sort of a bright teal color. There's lots of overlap between the species, which may mean that although we've seen speciation, the actual environmental niche of the species hasn't evolved much, in which case uh, we might expect that the niche conservatism model fits better. But I still think this is a, a useful test of the framework um, and informative for a similar reticulata. Uh, that is what I have for you all today. I hope you will check back. <laughs> Hopefully we'll have some cool results in the next year or so. I really hope you um, got the importance of predicting species distributions and also maybe our a little appreciation for a semina. Uh, I have a few people to thank. So the ASRC at the Graduate Center funded uh, a lot of the field work and the sequencing along with the New York Botanical Garden.
and the City College of New York. Um, I want to thank the Florida State Parks, Florida Fish and Wildlife, Florida Department of Ag, and the St. John's Water Management District for permitting for collections. Uh, I need to thank my lab members for uh, input in the project design and moral support through the last two years, especially uh, Anna and Fabian, thank you so much. Uh, I could name everybody. Um, uh, I wanna thank the Brown Lab, uh, Jason and Wilson, who, who also have uh, been really helpful in designing this work. Uh, the Florida Flora and Ecosystematics Facebook group was really helpful, uh, just talking about Asimina and Papa. Uh, and yeah, I'm happy to take any questions, hear your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you so much, Catherine. That was awesome. That was fantastic. I already see that we have some questions coming in, which is amazing. So just a reminder, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, I'll have you guys please write your comments in the chat and then I'll read them off uh, for the speaker to answer. So we got a couple already. I'm going to read them off for you. Uh, so we have, uh, first off, a thank you. Thanks for the great talk, Catherine. Uh, you mentioned that beetles and other animals are important for dispersal. Uh, is there an estimate for how far this animal dispersal can be? I'm wondering because about the multiple populations you sampled from and uh, if you think there is any chance of interbreeding uh, between those populations or if you think they're isolated. Um, that's a great question. Thank you. Thank you so much. So it's probably not likely that a seed from one of our, let me go back to our, to our sampling map quickly, that like in one generation, a plant is, or offspring is going from one of the sampled populations to another one. Um, I, I don't, I, I don't expect that any of its animal dispersers are moving quite that far, but there likely is like over generations connection between these populations. Uh, and that is something that we're going to look for once we have the genetic data. And it's actually going to be useful for us to look at how much connection exactly is between all of these populations, um, because that is something we can use as one of the summary statistics I mentioned to compare the empirical data and the uh, demographic models or the output from the demographic models. I'm going to follow up this question with a, a, a little bit of a probing, a probing question. I just wanted to, to uh, see if your answer would be different at all if this question was about gene flow rather than actual seed dispersal. So if we were talking about beetle pollinators instead of the animals that were eating the seeds, do you think that there is a chance of interbreeding between your populations? Uh, even less. Even less? <laughs> so, so actually our pollinators are there's some evidence that these, the pollen beetles especially, which we, are, we know are, are some of the, the common pollinators for this species, are, are probably o maybe only pollinating flowers on the same plant. Like there's no beetles that are moving between these populations. Wow. Yeah. Wow, so very poor dispersers. <laughs> very interesting. They get around, they get around. Okay. Uh, okay, here's another question for you. I just want to comment that I discovered uh, uh, Protographia marcellus, uh, that the, the Protographia marcellus used to fly uh, close to MYC uh, based on a guide from 1902, uh, which implies that A. triloba uh, used to be common in NYC area. I wonder how much historical references you have you have found uh, to these various species and the animals they support. Yeah, Asipina triloba is a really interesting uh, example. So there's two papers that came out just this year that were looking at Asipina triloba dispersal and sort of their patterns of genetic diversity specifically. And there's a lot of evidence that humans have been moving, like our, the indigenous people have been moving uh, these plants and using them as a food resource and 
other sorts of resources for a long time. Um, and specifically in New York City, I, I don't know about the past, but I know now <laughs> it's sort of, as the climate is warming, it seems that uh, Asimna triloba is still continuing like a northward march since after glaciation, like it's still expanding. So we have uh, at the New York Botanical Garden, uh, at the Brooklyn Botanical Garden, at some of our local parks around the city, um, volunteers. So, so trees that have nobody planted there, they just, they've showed up recently. Oh, interesting. Um, so a reminder, if you guys have questions, please write them in the chat and I'll read them out. Um, in the meantime, I have a, I have a question or two. Um, for, uh, first off, regarding the Lycor stuff that you talked about, we should definitely put you in contact with Stephanie, last month's speaker, yeah. because uh, she obviously is very, is very well informed on, on Lycor <laughs> like finickiness or whatever. Yeah. So um, let's talk after because I can get you her contact info. Sure. Yeah. Um, so I have I have another uh, question, an actual question. Um, this is something that I'm, I'm kind of interested in. So our environment, our local environment has changed quite a lot over the last say 200 years, um, you know, climate change and urbanization and everything. And, uh, and so it leaves me wondering that at least in certain cases, I'm wondering if we are accurately measuring uh, the adaptive niche characteristics for, for certain species, not necessarily Asimina, but, but other species, especially quite long lived species, whether we're talking about, about uh, you know, long lived trees or, or, you know, gopher tortoises or, you know, blue whales, whatever we're talking about. Um, I'm, I wanted to get your, your perspective on this. Uh, do you think that for situations like this, if we wanted to do a study like yours, that we would need to make some sort of correction uh, in our data uh, to account for uh, like the change that has occurred over the last couple centuries? Yeah, I think I mean, this is totally relevant for what we were just talking about with Asimina triloba, who is really still expanding northward uh, since the last glacial maximum, since the glaciers retreated. And their current range or the region that they current, currently occupy probably doesn't represent the total environmental conditions in which they could live. Uh, but I think for some of our other species, especially uh, not so long lived and, <laughs> and ones that uh, their ranges have been more stable over the last couple hundred years, um, it's maybe more likely that they are uh, in equilibrium, that they're, uh, the environmental space that they occupy is the actual environmental spaces that they can occupy. Right. Does that answer? Does that answer? Yeah, yeah, I think I think so. I mean, like ultimately this comes down to whether we think that the the species this very much has to do a lot with the the uh generation time of the species. And if if that species is sort of able to to keep up in the in the the race revolution, like the you know, the mm -hmm. red green hypothesis. Yeah, all of yeah. that fun stuff. And, and so, yeah, I, I certainly, I think it's something that, that is context dependent and species dependent. Um, yeah, I, that was very interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I don't see any additional questions. Um, so uh, if, if there's anything else that you want to like, you know, throw out there, feel free to. Um, in Otherwise, otherwise, I think that this was fantastic. Well, people were saying thank you in the chat. Um, thank yeah, you all for, for, for attending. For being here. Yeah. Um, oh, we do have a question. Okay. Or, or, or possibly. <laughs> no, no, no. It's all, it's all good. We definitely asked this. Um, yeah. So um, we have a great job. 
Uh, I'm always fascinated by a by species with a legacy of use by indigenous people and pawpaw fit the bill, uh, right? Do you think there is any exploration that may be done with these genomic data that you'll, uh, that you'll get to give us some insight into the indigenous use and spread? Yeah, that's that's a really interesting uh, question. So the there's lots of evidence that Assimina triloba uh, was used by indigenous people, is used by indigenous people, is is eaten today by people who live there by the trees. Um, <laughs> and uh, genomic data could like population scale genomic data could be super useful in sort of mapping uh, where popu like population connectivity and so like where uh, trees might have been moved from or populations might have been uh, uh, founded from. Uh, and in the, this in this recent paper, uh, uh, Trapnell 2021, they talk about um, these populations of Assimina triloba that have relatively low genetic diversity, so like founder effects, and are also along uh, documented like travel routes, which is really interesting. Uh, the data that we're collecting, uh, the population genetic data that we're collecting is primarily for Assimina reticulata, which while it is, while the fruit is edible, uh, it's like much smaller, not as tasty, sort of tastes like a unripe bland avocado. <laughs> so I don't think that there, there is uh, as much evidence for use by indigenous people for this species. Um, and so, uh, I'm not sure exactly how useful uh, the data that we're collecting will be for that, but there's definitely like a, a, an interesting story there. Yeah, thank you. Very cool. And it looks like paper has even been shared in the chat relating to this. So that's, that's super cool. <clears throat> thank you, everybody. Thank you for, for uh, joining us for this interesting discussion. And of course, thank you, Catherine, for giving that to us. Uh, we really appreciate it, of course. Um, so thank you everybody for, for, uh, being a part of this, for, for joining us on all the talks that we've had this year, we will, so this is the last talk for this year, but of course we will be returning next year. Um, our, our next talk will be in March and I hope that you all join us for this one as well.